Good day, trenders. Can you believe it's already 2017? January almost over and February fast approaching. Kids have gone back to school and adults back to work. And as usual, you're tuned in to Trends Travel. We have an amazing lineup for you, so do stay tuned. I'm your host for today, Eloise Kobel. Coming up next, we turn to crunch for all our healthy eating needs after the binge of the December holidays. We also make a stop in Rwanda to see what Rwanda has made. We take a turn in the island of the Camors. And lastly, we stop in Belgium to see a musical made about slavery. Stay tuned. With health and wellness and certainly weight loss after a very merry festive season being a top priority for almost everyone these days, it's no surprise that the crunch duo Kim and Daniel Browser are in love with sharing deliciously healthy and fresh foods and drinks. Crunch is a, a healthy food concept. What's really good about crunch is we've made healthy food understandable and we've also made healthy food delicious. We want to bring at Crunch, me and my sister, we want to bring healthy food to the mass market. Crunch, your not so average fast food joint, is for customers looking for healthy fast food. The best of eating healthy concepts have been brought together making healthy, delicious food convenient and serving it in a fun and responsible way. Crunch's goal is to make um, food that's understandable to the average person healthy. So what we came up with was a protein pancake. A lot of the other restaurants use almond flour and all these different ingredients, but we wanted to go with something that was really um, suitable to everyone and understandable to everyone. So our protein crumpets are made from oats, eggs, banana, honey, and a little bit of baking powder, a little bit of cinnamon, just, to, just for flavor. And yeah, they really, they taste great. They look like crumpets. They really make you feel like you're indulging, but in actual fact, you're eating something really, really healthy. So we really, it's one of our signature dishes and we absolutely love them. Owner Daniel Browser explains that the inspiration to start Crunch originated from his own love for living a holistic, healthy lifestyle. So we did a lot of research online and then we got into the kitchen and it was trial and error. And we've just really come up with a menu as we've gone along. We've listened to our customers. Our customers have told us what we like and don't like. We chat with some of our friends and we learned to cook good food at home and then we brought home cooked food to the world. Crunch believes that healthy eating should be fun and exciting and their mission is to provide a healthy fast food alternative but also to educate on how easy it is to eat healthily. We do a quinoa um, porridge, which is uh, made from a superfood called quinoa. It's originated in Peru, and it's um, so it looks like couscous. It looks like a carby, you know, really meaty meal, but it's actually made. It's actually a vegetable, so it's very high in protein and it's really, really great for you. And it fills you up. It's low GI. It's gluten free, so it's really great. And what we do here is we mix it with raw cacao, with banana, and we make it um, like a porridge, and it's. It's, it's served hot and it's really filling and then we also have a chai um, bowl which is made from chai seeds so chai seeds are they're actually quite crunchy if you eat them just raw but if you put them into any form of liquid they turn into a jelly like texture which is really really delicious in juices and in porridge and in oats um, but the way we do it is we soak them um, in uh, almond milk and they become really um, jelly like and we make a porridge and they very high in um, protein as well. They're high in um, omega fatty acids, which is um, those really great fats that you, you need um, for your body to act actually, it's those fats don't make you lose weight because they help your digestion. Um, and yeah, so it's a really delicious porridge and you can put a number of different toppings on all these meals, um, which for instance, our gluten-free muesli, which is made with coconut and a number of different seeds and coconut oil, also really, really delicious. And then our newest, more, most exciting new breakfast item is our acai smoothie bowls. Um, so people aren't familiar with acai, but it's a berry that uh, also it's originated in Brazil, and it's the new and upcoming superfood. So it's very really high in antioxidants, really great for your digestion, for cholesterol, cardiac health, um, and we put it into a smoothie, and it's really so, so delicious. And once again, top it with whatever you like, strawberries, bananas, gluten-free muesli, chai seeds, goji berries, any superfoods you like. Um, and yeah, that's our new exciting summer breakfast. I think like with quinoa and lentils, like I've learned for me, it kind of like
like expands in your stomach so it actually gives you that full fulfilling feeling so you may think oh, I can't eat that for a main meal but you'll actually realize that it like releases slowly in your body so you stay full for at least five or six hours we wanted to make it different from other health restaurants and once again really understandable to the average person so one of our key um, new items is uh, is our zucchini bowls um, and our banting bowls. So we've got uh, with a, like a zucchini noodle base or a broccoli base or a cauliflower rice base with our delicious Neapolitana sauce, um, which what's different about a Neapolitana sauce is it's got no added sugar, no butter or any of that. It's pure tomatoes, really rich and really, really healthy for you. Um, and then we also top that with some Parmesan cheese, some cottage cheese, a little bit of chili, really delicious and then our main thing that we sell at crunch and the thing that we absolutely passionate about is our salads we love salads and we've come up with some new different salads this summer so our one salad we've come up with is it's called it's summer salad it's a really fresh 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 salad and it's made with zucchini noodles lentils um, danish feta cranberries uh, sunflower seeds and it's really really it's our fresh take on almost like a world of salad you know it just pops in your mouth and then our next salad that we've um, introduced is our asian a crunchy asian chicken salad it's also delicious with our new teriyaki dressing so i've never ever we came up with its own our own dressing i've never heard of teriyaki dressing before so it's it's really different it's got cabbage peas raw corn, um, our classic uh, crunch chicken. So it's really, it's just a mixture of delicious vegetables with our Asian feel of the teriyaki dressing and delicious chicken. What we try to do is we try to bring the health as aspect into everything that we do. So not only the things that the customer can see, but the things that the customer can't see. So in terms of our spices that we use on our chicken and our vegetables, we never ever used um, kind of like pre-mixed spices. We buy the raw ingredients, we buy the raw spices and we mix them ourselves because we, what we've noticed is that the, the, the store-bought spices actually have things in it that they, they hidden things that are really, really unhealthy, for example, MSG. And as well in our smoothies, we don't use any bottle juices, we don't use box juices, concentrates, nothing like that. We use all fresh ingredients, all fresh fruit, and if we, make our, if we use orange juice, we freshly squeeze our orange juice. It's really all natural ingredients. I love the new innovative menu and being a vegetarian I think that there are a lot of options which I love. It's really difficult to find like very tasty delicious food that's also vegetarian so I really love that. All in all if you've not had your health fix yet you better head to Crunch pronto. You enjoy the rest of your day and I'll enjoy the rest of my smoothie. The second international kite festival in India's southern Telangana state has attracted scores of kite flyers from across the world. The skyline of Hyderabad city presented a grand sight of huge, attractively designed kites. Enthusiasts from various parts of the world were seen battling to outdo each other, showcasing their skills in the festival. The festival is witnessing participation from 17 countries with 70 international and 40 national kite flyers. that uh, this is a culture here because in Ukraine unfortunately kites are not so popular as for today but I hope something will change 
And here in Hyderabad, I see a lot of locals that come. It's amazing, and I hope that we will take this energy home to home. A lot of residents came to the venue as kites of all colors, sizes, and shapes hung in the sky, including some quirky ones in the shape of animals. A participant from Australia, Kevin Sanders, said that he was overwhelmed by the warmth and love he received from the people and was interested to come again next time. The support from the uh, um, Telangana uh, government has been wonderful. Uh, they've invited so many people from all around the world, including myself, and everyone is so friendly. The weather is beautiful and um, we've got plenty of wind, so we should have a great festival. The event has been organised by the Southern Telangana State Tourism Department to raise awareness about the importance of education and empowerment of girl children. Kite flying is popular in many parts of India, especially around the time of the Hindu festival of Makra Sakratani, which falls in the same week. During the festival, people try to bring down each other's kites using string coated with a sticky paste of ground-up glass or metal. Welcome back to Trends Travel. In this next segment, we take you to the rest of Africa and the rest of the globe. Stay tuned. A home tucked away in one of many lushing, sprawling hills that Rwanda is famous for. Priscilla Ruzibuka lives here with her parents. Her nieces are frequent visitors. The girls are her muses and models as well. I tried to look around the whole of Kigali. There are so many designs coming up, a lot of designers, but no one is doing kids' clothes. And then our government has abolished second-hand clothes. So in the next two years, there'll be no second-hand clothes in Kigali. And using my own nieces and other people I know, they always relied on second-hand nice clothes because kids need a lot of clothes. They're like, we can't really go in the shops and buy expensive clothes for everyday use. I was like, okay, maybe this is an opportunity. And I think it's adorable. I like it myself. The 26-year-old spent her early childhood in Tanzania. There, she had a nanny whose passion for fashion inspired a young Priscilla. You can imagine someone who I have stayed with for more than five, four, six years. During that time, we helped her to gain some skills, the tailoring skills. She spent most of her days under her nanny's sewing table, and there she picked up scraps and made dresses for her dolls. Even though the moving back to Rwanda meant that her nanny was out of sight, fashion was still very much on her mind. I started doing small baby stuff for friends, like bridal showers, baby showers, I mean. And I guess that's where it all started. At the time, she was pursuing her bachelor's degree in ICT, after which she got a cushy job at an NGO. Bye. While there, she pursued a master's in project management. All the while, her itch to create wasn't going away. But it wasn't just the desire to design that got her started on her path. She would take care of me while doing the clothes at the same time. And now, it's like 26 years later, she is a very good tailor. She's a big name. She's still in the same place. She lives in the same house. And whenever I go back, like her life has been changed. Her family, she said as a house help, the babysitter. But now she's a professional tailor. She's making a lot of money living the life that anyone else in town would live. Like here in Rwanda, if let's say there's a land that belongs to a family, children, boys will be given the priority. Like this land belongs to the boys because they believe a girl will get married and that property will be sent to another family. That's why I chose women. The reason we chose to work with Kipepeo instead of those other companies that approached us is because she had different products than theirs. She wanted to do children's clothes, and we thought this is something that we haven't done with any other person. And she wanted to start her own factory, and we thought that if we stay with her, we can be able to grow with her. When you, you, you look on, on her business, I mean, for me, I say it really came uh, when Rwanda needs it. 
because uh, I mean, taking into account the, the background of this country, yeah, they, there are many uh, who, are, who can say they are now youth, but uh, who didn't have really, I mean, good background by that time. Although now the government has all these up to 12 years children are going to school, but there is that gap of those who were during that time, and sometimes they feel that we are old to go back to school. Now, for that, those, especially the girls, what they need are more hands skills. Her business is the first of its kind in Rwanda. To get an extra edge, she enrolled in the Young African Leaders Initiative program in its business and entrepreneurship track. For eight weeks, she was measured, trimmed, cut, and designed into the young business leader she is today. The budding entrepreneur's move couldn't have come at a better time. Her mother, who's a successful business owner, in her own right, recognizes the opportunity. This recent enthusiasm for locally made product has led to the inception of the Made in Rwanda Expo, which Priscilla took part in. I think if we continue doing what we are doing slowly, we will grow, and if we grow, we will bring more people to work with us, and after, we will get more people to buy our products. So I believe in time, we will be able to accomplish what we want to achieve. She's not only making a name for herself in fashion business, but also economically empowering a new generation of women in Rwanda. It's a design that Priscilla reckons will never go out of fashion. For anyone traveling to Ethiopia's south, Awasa is a great stopover. Lake Awasa is the main reason why most people pay a visit to this capital of the southern people's region. Occupying an area of 95 kilometers and 21 meters deep, the water body is popular for several fun activities. Bird watching, fish and boat rides for cruise lovers. The atmosphere, so beautiful, beautiful, unbelievable. This freshwater lake is home to rich biodiversity, spectacular flora and fauna. It's mainly famed for its bird and fish, hence a tourist joint. Tourists pay for boat rides to explore more of the lake. A cruise costs two US dollars per 30 minutes. This tourist group from Kenya has come to witness the beauty this marvel of nature holds. Phoebe Minyoro is a fascinated birder. Birds are interesting creatures or uh, animals to, to just watch and observe. They have uh, their own different characteristics. And in terms of bird watching, you get to understand uh, the importance of each bird in the ecosystem. Uh, you appreciate the little small birds that travel, that make uh, their way from Russia to East Africa, like the willow warbler. The pelican is the most conspicuous species of bird due to its size and special features. Uh, the pelicans, oh, they're migratory birds, so you can find them. We also have some in, in, in Kenya, and they're migratory birds, so it's, it's also for them, it's, it's also interesting to, to find, or rather to see them uh, just there. And also in terms of their feeding habits and uh, just their charisma, because they're really big, chunky birds. The majestic birds mainly feed on fish, amphibians, crustaceans, and other smaller birds. All these in plenty here. Regardless of their excellent preying ability, fishermen once in a while leave their chores just to feed their buddies. Food is very important for birds. Um, you may go to Lake Nakuru uh, expecting to find, you might have seen flamingos yesterday at Lake Nakuru, but if uh, something happens to the food or if their biological clock decides it's time for them to go, then it's time for them to go. And then with wildlife, they're just it's nature, you can't explain it. That's, that's what makes it interesting. 
The marabou stock is another big band at Likawasa. It's at times referred to as the undertaker due to its clock-like wings and back, skinny white legs, some have a large white mass of hair. There are more than 160 species coexisting here. Others include the African fish eagle, yellow wagtail, little eaglets, common waxbill, and black tail godwit. You need to spend a few months to master every bird. Mwange Gitao owns a tour company back in Kenya, and most of his trips are bird watching adventures to some of Kenya's rich bird sanctuaries. Being an ontological guide, one of my expectations was to add new birds. We call them rifles. I have never been to Ethiopia, so I anticipated to see some new birds, of which I did. The experience was awesome. <coughs> Besides watching a variety of birds, you will also spot Ethiopian fishermen along the shores. Most of them fish for subsistence, while others sell to make ends meet. One fish goes for between three to five dollars, depending on the size. You could also take a break to take a few shots with friends as a reminder that you are once part of this breathtaking experience. Colombians took to the streets on the first week of January in the annual Blacks and Whites Carnival celebrating diversity in the southwestern city of Pasto. The celebration, which UNESCO named a masterpiece of oral and intangible heritage of humanity in 2009, draws on the South American country's indigenous Spanish and African traditions. In the most anticipated two days of the festival, participants dress in black and white to symbolize unity and equality while celebrating ethnic and cultural diversity. Joining the harmonious mix on Friday was tourist Robert Gazat, who thoroughly enjoyed the spectacle. Anything that is celebrated as a cultural legacy is nice. So when you're having fun with it, it's even better. And uh, we like the music. On the Day of the Whites, artists put together a six-hour parade featuring colorful outfits. On the Day of the Blacks, participants are encouraged to paint their faces black to commemorate the liberation of slaves. Hoy es el día especial de los negritos, donde cada pastuso hace la pintica. ¿Cuál es la idea de la pintica? La idea es igualdad y equidad, representar que todos somos iguales, que todos somos seres humanos y que todos queremos jugar, integrar. Siempre es la unidad del pueblo pastuso. In years past, President Juan Manuel Santos has appeared at the festivities. The annual event takes place on the first week of January every year. I do hope you enjoyed that, but right now we're taking a five-minute break, so I'll see you right after that. As you sail along the Indian Ocean through the Mozambican Channel, you come across the enchanting islands of Comoros. About 1,100 kilometers from mainland Africa, the majestic mountainous island of Anjuan greets you. Welcome to the Paradise of Spice, the second largest of Comoros' four islands. Among them, Grand Comoros, Moheli, Mayotte, and Anjuan. It's very beautiful. I, I don't think I've ever been anywhere so beautiful and so remote. Um, it's very hard to get to, um, but it's a lovely island. Mutamudu is a capital. It is home to 30,000 people. Most visitors to the town of Mutamudu live with an unforgettable experience. 
Walking through the Mutsamudu market, your senses are pleasantly assaulted by spicy scents of the country's best exports. The citadel, donned with a defensive wall and cannons, gives a perfect aerial view of the city. Built by the first Sultan of Anjuan, Abdallah I, in the 18th century, the citadel was meant to protect the sultans and citizens from Malagasy invaders. They built the citadel at the top of the city so that they can have a better view of oncoming invaders. And the sultans also had a way of moving from the Ujumbe palace to the citadel without leaving the fortress. It was built with stones, honey and sun. Abdallah I installed the cannons after he requested for assistance from the British and the French. So if you look closely, you'll notice French and British architecture. Today, it's one of Anjuan's main tourist attractions and recreational grounds for local artists. If you make it in time, you will catch sight of the terrific sunset sinking into the Indian Ocean and the Medina. Ibrahim Hassan knows this place like the back of his hand. The Medina is his birthplace and home of 35 years. He's a social rights activist and a tour guide, always willing to give lessons to anyone curious about his backyard's history. This is the entrance to the Medina, the gate. The wall started on the road. From there up to here is where the gate was. There are conditions for a town to be called a Medina. One, you have to have a wall surrounding it, a mosque, a tomb, and a public gathering space. Those are the qualifications. This concept was imported from the Middle Eastern countries. So far in Comoros, we have five Medinas left. This one is a Mutsumudu, another one still in Anjuan. In Moroni there is one, and in Ikoni, and also in Mbeni and Fomboni in Moheli. And right now, we are fighting to have them included in the list of World Heritage Sites. The Medina, like many others across the world, has narrow streets about two meters wide. The style is inspired by Arabic architecture, originally from Indonesia, Oman, and Persia. However, most of the structures here are run down, and most of them require renovation. The old Friday Mosque is one of the most respected prayer sanctuaries. Said Ali Abu Bakr, a former history teacher, hangs around here minutes before the evening prayer. This is the first mosque to ever be built in Mutsamudu, built in 1650. As you know, Islam was introduced in 900 BC. Not everyone gains access to the Ujumba Palace, but if you're lucky like ours, you'll be immersed into the impressive history of the once royal residence of the last Sultan of Anjouan, Abdallah III. Another site you can't miss is a graveyard across the street. This is the graveyard for the locals and former royals. This one here is the tomb of Bint and Kill. Her other name was Intelligent and Kill because she was the only one who conceptualized the design for the minarets of the mosque and when she died, she was buried here. For now, Ibrahim stops at nothing to keep the history of his hometown alive. Hamburg's Al Philharmonie Concert Hall opened on January the 11th, delivering one of Germany's most prestigious 21st century cultural projects, albeit some seven years late and busting its budget. The new landmark with a red brick base and glass structure on top, curved windows and a roof that resembles the crest of a wave, is built on a 1960s warehouse that stored tea, tobacco and cocoa. 
Overlooking Hamburg Harbour, it evokes a ship floating on water and is part of a development that uses old warehouses to create residential and office space in Germany's biggest port. Chancellor Angela Merkel, a regular at the annual Wagner Festival in Beirut, and President Joachim Rauch attended the inauguration. The program included works by Beethoven, Cavalieri and Wagner. Music lovers were keen to judge the acclaimed acoustics in the main hall, which has 2,100 seats, and where no member of the audience is more than 30 meters from the conductor. The Hanseatic trading port of Hamburg, now a media hub with chic shopping arcades, as well as its red light district around the Reeperbahn, hopes the hall will help draw tourists to Germany's second biggest city. Swiss architects Herzog and Demuron have called the Alphil Harmony a city in itself, with restaurants, a hotel and a 37-meter-high plaza between the brick and glass layers open to the public, offering a panorama of the city. The cost of the city was put at about 75 million euros back in 2003, but has ballooned to some 790 million euros due in part to delays and legal disputes. It had been due to open in 2009. Da wird mit Sicherheit einiges in, in Bewegung geraten, was seit dem herkommt, weil das gleiche Thema hatten wir damals in Sydney auch, wo alle gesagt haben, um Gottes Willen, wie hässlich sieht denn das Ding halt eben aus? Und jeder, der irgendwie nach, nach Australien fliegt und nach Sydney kommt, dann macht erstmal ein Foto von den, von den komischen Muscheln, die da halt eben am Strand liegen, die aussehen wie so ein Opernhaus. Und von daher denke ich mal, dass es für Hamburg nicht gerade das Schlechteste ist. So. Ich bin mir nicht ganz sicher, ob das Ergebnis wirklich so überragend ist, wie man es erwartet hätte. Irgendwie. Aber es ist, es ist wunderschön geworden und es ist auch von innen sehr schön. Und dieser große Saal ist ganz hervorragend gelungen. Ähm, also was Besseres hätte Hamburg nicht passieren können. Es ist bloß einfach zu teuer. The opening has come as a relief to Germans whose reputation for efficiency has been dented by delays on infrastructure projects, most notably Berlin's new airport. Now we know how much you hate parting with trains travel, but don't despair, it's not over yet. We'll be back right after this break. It is a beautifully hot summer day in January, and while I enjoy the outdoors, you can see what's coming up next. Spanish conductor Jody Saval brought together musicians from Europe, Africa and South America in Brussels on January 10th for a concert billed as a musical journey relating 400 years of the history of slavery. I think the music, it's, uh, 
to reel through living history of the human being. Because, because with the music, we travel in the time. Any song from different epochs uh, gives us the same emotion as was in the 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And this, with the music, we can understand things that we cannot understand in, with reading only. We see in a, in a book so many victims of this, of this, you say, oh, pity. But if you hear a song talking about this, we have another feeling. In The Roots of Slavery, Saval put together music linked to places that were affected by the grisliest aspect of triangular trade, the enslavement and deportation of millions of Africans between the 15th and the 19th century. After playing many of this um, music, I was thinking, well, I would like to know what was the music from the other side. This is the music from the colonial, for the conquerors, not for the slaves. The concert featured music by artists from Mali, Madagascar, Morocco, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina and Venezuela, backed by Savali's vocal group La Capella Real de Catalunya and Hesperion, a period instrument ensemble he founded in 1974. El espectáculo que nos convoca Jordi precisamente la diferencia que tiene es que no pasa a ser un espectáculo de la belleza sino precisamente un espectáculo que lo que invita es a la reflexión de un suceso antiguo desde la música que hacemos, pero que todavía hoy sigue estando presente de otra manera. La esclavitud realmente hoy... La esclavitud. Saval said he thought Europeans would handle the current refugee crisis differently if they had their ancestors' responsibility in the slave trade in mind. He developed the idea of a project on slavery after interpreting religious music. Only if we know the history from our ancestors, we can be able to build a new uh, future. And I think this is what moves me to prepare and do all these projects about the history because I think we need the, the art and the music helps us to understand what happens in our history, to have a reflection and be able to create better conditions for the future. Saval will resume performing the roots of slavery in Hamburg on April 12th and Lisbon the next day. He added that half of the music played during the concert would be improvised, saying that Europe was the only continent that had lost this practice with the emergence of romantic music in the 19th century. French auction house Tajan displayed on January the 10th a 15 million euro drawing by Leonardo da Vinci representing the figure of the martyred Saint Sebastian tied to a tree in a landscape. The drawing in brown ink measuring 19.3 centimeters by 13 centimeters is believed to be one of the eight Saint Sebastians mentioned in the Codex Atlanticus, a list compiled by da Vinci himself. Uh, exceptionnel et même rarissime de trouver un dessin de Léonard de Vinci. Nous n'en avons pas euh, d'autres exemples. Je pense qu'il n'y a pas eu de dessin découvert depuis euh, au moins une cinquantaine d'années par l'artiste. Euh, le dessin est dans un bel état de conservation parce que toutes les parties principales sont vraiment préservées. On the reverse side of the sketch, experts also found notes written backwards and diagrams about light and shadow relating to da Vinci's study of optics. The notes in reverse were a leading indication of the drawing's provenance, Prate said. Et au dos du dessin, donc, nous avons euh, découvert cette, cette partie Euh, donc, euh, qui représente euh, ici euh, un croquis euh, typique de Léonard et notamment des fameux dessins et études que l'on retrouve dans ses codex. Et sur la droite, son écriture inversée qui est également caractéristique de l'artiste et que lui seul pouvait faire et euh, qui est en quelque sorte une signature euh, du dessin. Oui. 
The auction house worked closely with world-renowned expert on Leonardo drawings, Dr. Carmen C. Bembeck, curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Et donc, dans cet intervalle, ils ont classé le dessin Trésor National, ce qui nous empêche dans l'immédiat donc de le vendre à l'international. Donc nous nous dirigeons plutôt pour une vente euh, privée, une vente de gré à gré avec le musée du Louvre qui se peut-être trouvera un mécène pour l'acquérir. As it has been recently designated a national treasure, the drawing cannot be sold to private collectors and will find a home with the Louvre as a likely candidate. With an air of Las Vegas glamour, thousands of people took to the streets of rural Australian town of Parks to honor entertainer Elvis Presley in the town 25th annual street parade. The glitzy spectacle is part of the five-day Parks Elvis Festival held every year to celebrate Presley's birthday. This year's parade kicked off with the town marching down the streets, ringing his bell, followed by bands playing the King's Major Hits, Die Hard Fan, dressed up as their idol, posing in old-timer cars, as well as families parking on Elvis-themed floats. There is something so Australian about a festival, about an American singer in the middle of an outback country town. In keeping with the 2017 theme of Elvis' iconic film, Viva Las Vegas may not only don jumpsuits and wigs, but feathers, sequins, and all things Vegas inspired while singing and dancing to Presley's music. There's only one Elvis Presley, there's only one king of rock and roll, and uh, they all keep coming back to celebrate uh, what he was and what he did. And um, Priscilla said that uh, she wanted people never to forget, but if you look around, you'll see that uh, she, no one's ever going to forget, especially with all the little children and all their parents coming here uh, to parks to celebrate. It's the largest festival in the country. Even now in its 25th year, the Parks Elvis Festival is continuing to grow. Oh, this year is just as good as anything, especially on the 25th anniversary and everything else like that. It's been absolutely fantastic. The crowd was very responsive and it makes it so much better when it's like that because you just, you just go at it all the time. So we're getting more and more and more involved. So you just can't keep, you just can't highlight how good it feels coming down the street. As for the festival goers themselves, they said it was the best one yet. But the whole parade is fantastic. Everybody's involved. Uh, it's just an amazing sight. First time I've ever seen it. I'll be back next year. The Parks Elvis Festival came to an end on the January 15th. The Grand World of Ice and Snow Festival kicked off in Harbin, one of the coldest cities in China with a spectacular display of ice sculptures. 
This year's festival themed Po on the Crown of Ice and Snow, Harbin, and organized by the China National Tourism Administration and local governments, runs till mid-February and is expected to attract tourists from China and around the world. Visitors flock to the city to enjoy sculptures, ice slides, and watch a swimming competition. A 22-year-old university student, Zhao Fanlu, was visiting the festival for the first time and was stunned by the views of the night. <音>我们是大概四点进场 Yu Jianlin, also from northeastern China, said the freezing temperature was almost the same as his hometown, but he was still captivated by the amazing ice sculptures. Organizers say the festival, which is open for 60 days and boasts a variety of snow and ice related activities, draws several million tourists from across the country and internationally each year. And it's a wrap, folks. And that's all we have for you on this week's edition of Trends Travel. Do join us again next week, same time, same place, on Channel 404, DSTV and SABC3.